this lecture will be on T.S. Eliot's theory of poetry. I would be giving a short introduction to T.S. Eliot's evolution as a critic and his theory of poetry with reference to some of his essays that were published during his lifetime. T.S. Eliot can be regarded as a central Anglo-American poet and also, of course, a critic of the 20th century. He is the author of, you remember, the most influential poem, The Wasteland, published in 1922. And he is also the writer of some of the most authoritative literary essays and reviews. In the modern history of literary theory and criticism, or even modern critical theory, Eliot shares with Dr. Samuel Johnson, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, and of course, Matthew Arnold, a special position. And among those writers who are poets as well as critics, T.S. Eliot is also trying to define the critical standards of an era. And this era is, of course, the modernist era. And recast the literary tradition by establishing the key terms for analysis and an evaluation of the works of art, especially poetry. So immense was his influence and authority that the contemporary poets referred to him as the Pope and definitely he was the Pope of his generation. He was born in St. Louis, Missouri, the seventh and the youngest child of Henry Ware Eliot and Charlotte Stearns Eliot. So he was an amateur poet and started his career as a volunteer writer. From 1898 to 1905, he attended Smith Academy and a preparatory school where his studies included, of course, Latin and Greek. He was also well versed with rhetoric, French and German. From 1905 to 96, he attended Milton Academy in Massachusetts. And from 1906, he entered the famous Harvard University, receiving his bachelor's degree in 1909 his master's in 1910. During his stay at the Harvard, Eliot became interested in the philosophy and comparative literature. Especially his main area of interest was Dante's Divine Comedy and this was a good discovery for him. Some other influences included poets and humanists like George Santayana from whom Eliot took a course in modern philosophy and gradually he developed as a literary scholar influenced by the works of Irene Babbitt and he became gradually a foe of Romanticism. So Eliot also studied 19th century French literary criticism. Such influence on him was seen and gradually he developed his critical theory and his own poetical writings by coming very close to a movement of consciousness propounded by the French philosopher Henri Bagasso. Eliot's poetry and criticism, his critical experience at the Harvard University and his stay there, especially his reading of Arthur Simon's work, The Symbolist Movement in Literature, that was published in 1899, introduced T.S. Eliot to the entire group of the French symbolist poetry and poets, as well as the contemporary critical fervor. And Eliot was then, at that time, busy writing his early verse, publishing some of these in the Harvard Advocate. From 1909 to 1911, he worked on two of his best poems, as we know, The Portrait of a Lady and The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. And in these poems, he is drawing a style of irony and symbolism, perhaps more influenced by the works of Robert Browning and, one can say, the works of John Donne. So we will find T.S. Eliot going back to the works of Robert Browning and the works of John Donne, the metaphysical poets, and drawing much of his inspiration from the critical writing, even in his poetry. The French symbolist movement also allowed T.S. Eliot to evolve his own perception of symbolism in poetry. And of course, Ezra Pound's influence gave him the scope to introduce imagism in poetry. In T.S. Eliot's works, we have, therefore, the influence of French symbolist poetry as well as 
the influence of the contemporary American writings like the imagist works of Ezra Pound and his contemporaries. T.S. Eliot was busy, busy writing himself, writing words himself and he published his works as I said in the Harvard Advocate between 1909 and 1911. He was also influenced by the works of poets like Arthur Rambo and Jules Lafaugue, as mentioned by Simons, Arthur Simons in the Symbolist Movement of Literature. Eliot was definitely a self-made modernist, a modernist whom his friends usually called, who trained himself and modernized himself on his own. So in selected poems, Ezra Pound gives an introduction and refers to Eliot's comment on poetry. So Eliot says that the form in which I began to write in 1908 or 99, 1909 was directly drawn from the study of La Forge together with the later Elizabethan drama. So he is trying to read a wide variety of works and trying to modify, even parodying the verbal techniques of the other poets. After studying a year at the Sorbonne in Paris, Eliot again returned to Harvard to pursue his graduate work and serve as a teaching assistant. So at this period, there is another turn in Eliot's development as an artist as well as critical theorist. For his dissertation topic, he took up philosophy. He focused on the writings of a British idealist philosopher F. H. Bradley. F. H. Bradley wrote a work called Appearance and Reality in 1893. So this research led Eliot to the University of Marburg in Germany in the summer of 1914. But war, the First World War, was looming large and therefore he again relocated himself to Martin College, Oxford and then he was to settle in England permanently. Around 1914 September, Eliot met Pound, who quickly became his advisor, editor, literary agent and the work that was developing during this time is The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. This was published in Poetry Magazine in the month of June 1915. Eliot married Vivian Haywood and the marriage of course proved unhappy. So the mental and physical condition of Vivian and her illness deepened in 1920s and 30s, harrowing for both Eliot and his wife. This despair is reflected in his torment, in his bitterness and much of the isolation expressed in much of his poetry. So written under the shadow of this, we have the wasteland coming through the works, through the pen of Eliot. Eliot once claimed that no artist produces great art. Interesting comment. No artist produces great art by a deliberate attempt to express his personality. What a poet does, according to Eliot, a poet expresses his personality indirectly, indirectly through concentrating upon a task which is a task in the same sense as the making of an efficient engine or the turning of a jug or a table leg. From this perspective, Eliot's work itself seems to be impersonal and objective. Yes, definitely it is filled with several marks, several dramatic situations, role playing, multiple voices, polyphony and unsaturated heteroglossia. Yet it is saturated everywhere too with displaced personal pain, a sense of regret, despair, even sexual, sexual desire, emotional and spiritual yearning. So Eliot was doing some work in the schools and the colleges, gave lectures in literature and was gradually developing his critical temper. By March 1717, 1917, he shifted from one job to another job and finally Prufock and other observations appeared in 1917 and on the literary criticism he published some of his essays in the Times Literary Supplement. Other leading periodicals also published some of his essays and these essays are then conclude, uh, included in the work called The Sacred Wood of 1920. Of course The Sacred Wood is a landmark collection of criticism and theory especially of modernism, modernist art, 
and modern poetry. Eliot through a gradual hard work, devotion and much of criticism also came very near to nervous background. But it was the close acquaintance with Ezra Pound who supported, edited his works and turned Eliot's jumble into a good and bad things into something that is called a poet. The Wasteland, definitely in 1922, it was produced. In this work, we have elusive, experimental and technical daring. And the work shows learned, artly wit of T.S. Eliot. It is a text of literary modernism. The poem was published in The Criterion, a new literary and cultural quarterly edited by T.S. Eliot in October 1922. So the contemporary critics, intellectuals and general readers found the wasteland a hallmark of literature and with Ulysses it can be regarded as the most influential work of modernism. The wasteland among the readers invoked or evoked a sense of waste and sterility of a western world ravaged by the horrors of World War I. So this world war has brought carnage to an unprecedented scale. More than 8.5 million soldiers and perhaps 13 million civilians died in the First World War. This harrowing experience of the First World War led T.S. Eliot to compose this poem, The Wasteland. The Wasteland is not a poem as such about war, but it is a poem about the trauma of war, about the after effect of war and about the regression of the human civilization to the state of primitive savagery. Otto Spengler's, of course, The Decline of the West, that was then published in English as a translated work from French, influenced T.S. Eliot. So Spengler's thesis was that the heights of the Western civilization was reached at the time of the Renaissance. And after that, from Jacobian period onward, we have a steady decline of the Western civilization. The First World War led to the last barbarous end of this Western civilization. And from thence, according to Spengler, we have the regression of the human beings to the primitive stage of savagery. This regression of man constitutes the core of the wasteland. But wasteland is also a collection of voices, multiple voices. So many characters are there. They are all included. And it is a snapshot episodic collage of the world gone wrong. So April is a cruelest month, cactus grow, unreal city under the brown fog. This is a wasteland of human experience, wasteland of a disastrous civilizational progress, especially after the First World War, which Eliot of course saw not as a progress, but as a regression of mankind, to the state of primitive savagery. In Eliot's literary and cultural works, we have a force and this force is permanent in the works of 1920s and 30s. He was working then as an editor of the Criterion and the work journal continued up to 1939. Several leading English modernists contributed to this journal called the Criterion that continued up to 1939. Contributors like Virginia Woolf and James Joyce gave this journal its core importance and it was the first work to publish in English significant European writers like Jean Cocteau, Marshall Krauss. In 1925, T.S. Eliot accepted a position in the form of Faber and Gower, later it was called Faber and Faber which became a leading publishing house and the publisher of poets from Ezra Pound to Sylvia Plath. Even modern works are published by the same publisher. He began writing plays in the 1930s with the first fragment play called The Rock and after that Murder in the Cathedral in 1935 and he enjoyed writing with considerable popular success even giving box office hit for the Western theatre with his plays like 
the family reunion and the cocktail party. Cocktail party was produced in 1950. Around 1927, Eliot became a British citizen and joined the Church of England. Eliot is often accused of being Anglo-Catholic poet. In the following year, he announced for his Lancaster's lot Andrews, a collection of critical essays, and he was self-proclaimed, I quote, classicist in literature, royalist in politics, and Anglo-Catholic in religion. So critics of T.S. Eliot often point out this self-confessed analysis of T.S. Eliot as a classicist in literature, royalist in politics, and Anglo-Catholic in religion. Eliot definitely was conservative, even reactionary, and never radical, and sometimes he drifted close to fascism, and was a racist, and was also anti-Semitism. So in his social and cultural writings and in much of his literary criticism of the 1930s and 40s, Eliot is austere and sometimes censorious in attitude of pontificating in tone. As the Norton editors have said, from 1932 to 33, he held the Charles Eliot Norton Professorship of Poetry at Howard and Dev delivered several lectures and these lectures were later on anthologized in the work called The Use of Poetry and the Use of Criticism that got published in 1933. Much of his late cultural criticism, ironically, do not present a very happy, go lucky, good world. Rather, it presents in a very gloomy manner, a resentful, even hectoring world of literary criticism. So it diminishes by force and tries to produce some of the best of Eliot's literary criticism. By 1948, he was already a great name and when he won the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1948 and was awarded the Order of Merit by King George VI, so he became the reckoning name of the generation. His Critical theory can be first seen in his most famous work called The Tradition and the Individual Talent. Tradition and the Individual Talent was published in 1919. And this essay begins famously with a statement that Eliot makes. Eliot writes, in English criticism, we seldom speak of tradition. Interesting. In English criticism, we seldom speak of tradition. So with poise and authority of T.S. Eliot's critical voice, backed by his masterful performance as a poet, soon made tradition, tradition, the word tradition, as a key topic for poets, for critics, for intellectuals, and teachers of literature in academy. Eliot's idea of tradition is therefore at the core of T.S. Eliot's critical theory. So best of his canonical texts of modern Anglo-American literary criticism, like F.R. Levy says, Revaluation, Tradition and Development in English Poetry, and Cleon Brooks, Modern Poetry and The Tradition, 1939. Both these books, as the title suggests, were simply expansion of T.S. Eliot's ideas about tradition. And many other books were similarly based on the same term that he had first articulated. So what is the idea of tradition for T.S. Eliot? For T.S. Eliot, each poem exists within the tradition from which it takes shape and which it in turn redefines. So for Eliot, tradition is both something to which the poet must be faithful and something that he or she actively makes. So poetry is a combination of tradition and novelty for T.S. Eliot. This novelty emerges out of being not removed from tradition, but rather being steeped in tradition. Critics like Harold Bloom, we remember Harold Bloom published a famous work called Anxiety of Influence, have therefore characterized T.S. Eliot as a, I quote, weak poet critic because of his priority that he assigns to tradition. And to tradition because by doing this, Critics often overlook the extent to which the poet challenges and revises the concept of tradition. 
So what happens to a new work when a new work of art is created? Edit assesses and then replies that something happens. Something happens simultaneously to all the works of art. Works of art that preceded it. So a new poem is born out of the past. There is a continuity of the past tradition in the present forms of literary expression. Eliot, of course, have been criticized for seeing tradition as a simultaneous order, structuralist, a living whole, as an ideal order. And even when he talks about the mind of Europe, a poet cannot write in isolation, he says, a poet writes with the entire mind of Europe. So these are idealizing concepts that Eliot's critical theory is filled with internal contradictions, even conflicts, certain omissions and careful selections. Another famous essay of T.S. Eliot is, of course, The Metaphysical Poets. This work was published in 1921. This is another work, a very important work in the history of modern criticism. Almost as soon as it appeared, the difficult 17th century metaphysical poets, John Donne, Andy Marvel, and the contemporaries, they were brought again back into the center of critical theory, criticism, and poetry. So these poets were called metaphysical poets. And T.S. Eliot describes them as, I quote, more often named than read more often read than profitably studied. Interesting. They became model for good poetry for T.S. Eliot. Eliot's essay can be considered as a condensed, argumentative, vituperative attack on the poetry of the past, especially the poetry of the Romantic period. And his return back to the metaphysical poets is actually a kind of assertion of the new creed of poetry with which he was working at that period. So in this work, The Metaphysical Poets, he deploys the evaluative terms that 18th century Samuel Johnson has used against the metaphysical poets. You remember that Samuel Johnson, Dr. Samuel Johnson has stated that metaphysical poetry refers to the poets, John Donne and his contemporary, who in their poems brought the most heterogeneous ideas and yoked these heterogeneous ideas by violence together. John Dryden had earlier said that these poets affect the metaphysic. And Dr. Johnson talks about this yoking by violence together of divergent heterogeneous ideas in order to elevate the poets, elevate the eminent precursors insisting that modern poetry modern poetry must also be difficult like the metaphysical poets works he packed the metaphysical poets with unelaborated argument and assertion stressing in particularly the 17th century disastrous dissociation of sensibility by dissociation of sensibility he says that there is in the mind of the poet intellect thought and there is in the heart of the poet emotion and feeling. Dissociation of sensibility refers to a breach, a dissociation of the sensibility related to the thought and intellect and the sensibility related to emotion and feeling. If there is this breach between thought and emotion, intellect and feeling, then according to T.S. Eliot, there is this dissociation of sensibility. And this dissociation of sensibility he found as a disastrous thing in the works of 17th century poets, in the works of even 19th century poets, even in the works of the 18th century poets. So from 17th century to the 19th century, most of the poets, for of course different reasons, were affected by this dissociation of sensibility. For example, the neoclassical poets, they only thought according to T.S. Eliot and with their intellect, like the works of 
John Dryden and Alexander Pope, they only thought and with their intellect shaped the poetic world and allowed their fancy to roam and create artificial poetry, devoid of the emotion and feeling. On the other hand, in the pre-romantic and the romantic works, T.S. Eliot found again a dissociation of sensibility because the romantic poets thought and felt feelings and emotions dominated and they did not think without exercising their intellect, they wrote poetry. And this poetry was, of course, what Wordsworth has stated, a spontaneous overflow of powerful feeling and emotion. And T.S. Eliot simply condemns the spontaneity of emotional outpouring through poetry. This is unjust because T.S. Eliot simply did not consider William Wordsworth's definition of poetry having two parts, the poetic process having two parts. Poetry takes its origin from emotion recollected in tranquility and this part is totally missing in T.S. Eliot's comment on the romantic poets. Now what about this unified sensibility? Unified sensibility talks about the unification of intellect with emotion, the unification of thought with feeling. This T.S. Eliot found in the metaphysical poets. So metaphysical poets, they thought and they also felt. So they intellectualized things with a passionate heart. This was T.S. Eliot's view. Now just see the poems of John Donne. T.S. Eliot will be referring to John Donne's poem. So our love, John Donne is writing, our love, we are stiff to encompasses are too. Thy foot, the fixed foot, doth not move, but doth too when the other does. So this is poetry. So this use of compass and the use of love, the metaphor joined by violence together, scientific, intellectual and also passionately emotional, make the unification of sensibilities in the poems of John Donne. John Donne also dramatized emotions, created a set of situation, created some objectivity through such dramatization. And this captures the imagination of T.S. Eliot, who again regards this as a unified sensibility, where the objectivity is maintained in the work of art. So we have in T.S. Eliot, the metaphysical poets elaborate arguments about this assertion, stressing in particular the dissociation of sensibility into thought and feeling. In the process, he also illustrates how the tradition is made is forced into the form and later generation of writers require to pick up from the past. Many of the readers of Eliot took this generalization as limited, as of course literal truth and the skeptics, skeptics did not consider this as a good thing. Frank, Frank Kermode, for example, in his work The Romantic Image, judged that refuting T.S. Eliot demanded full-scale scholarly and critical demonstration. So it is very difficult to refute T.S. Eliot's argument because it is classicist, logical, new classical in his argument and therefore it is very difficult to refute his argument, although you can condemn T.S. Eliot, but you cannot refute his arguments. T.S. Eliot liked being a bit of troublemaker, so he was like a terrible brat of his own generation, saying outrageous things from high and often quite contradictory things he often makes, statements. He is a courageous critic, an artist who calls things a spade a spade. For example, in the essay Hamlet and his Problems that was published in 1920, T.S. Eliot introduces his brilliant theory named Objective Correlative. So Objective Correlative, modern postmodernist criticism has often refuted this structuralist view of art. So, according to T.S. Eliot, objective correlative, in other words, a set of objects, a situation, a chain of events, which shall be the formula for that particular emotion, such that when the external facts which must terminate in sensory experience are given, the emotion is immediately evoked. T.S. Eliot uses William Shakespeare's Hamlet as a test case, 
And interestingly, while dealing with Hamlet, he finds that Hamlet is an artistic failure, a monolith of art, ambiguous, and a text where there is a disaster with objective correlative. Why is this condemnation of Hamlet as an artistic failure? Because Eliot found that it is the emotion, emotion, emotion that Shakespeare evokes and the emotion is almost in excess, subjective and lopsided in favor of the central protagonist Hamlet. The facts of the story, is, these are there, but these facts are superseded by the dramatic action and the dramatic action is further superseded by the soliloquizing Hamlet at the center of the play. So although we find that this judgment might be absurd, but T.S. Eliot was perhaps right when he talked about that Hamlet, who takes the center stage, thinks, speaks, does, or procrastinates from the beginning to end. Much of his mental condition, well described in the play, is not supported adequately by what the other characters think about Hamlet, what the characters, other characters are actually in the play, what, are, what is the psychological makeup. So it is lopsided in favor of T.S. Eliot. So this identification with the character as a subject rather than as an object in Shakespeare's Hamlet made T.S. Eliot make this comment that Hamlet is an artistic failure, although he definitely revised his argument in his later essays, but artistic failure was that with which he launched a frontal attack on the works of, of Shakespeare and definitely that with the purpose because he, will, he is also an artist, poet, critic, a dramatist who will be resurrecting the works of the contemporaries of William Shakespeare. Jacobian writers like John Webster. In John Webster, interestingly, Webster said in his poem, Whispers of Immorality, that Webster saw the skull beneath the skin. So if Webster can see the skull beneath the skin, how can it be that Shakespeare failed to see even the skin of the characters in Hamlet? Except Hamlet, of course. So this absurd judgment with which Eliot proceeds may not be supported now in the present context, but definitely what he uttered with such assurance cannot be simply refuted. He was definitely a very good critic in formulating the nature and function of literary criticism. And most of the American new critics like John Crow Ransom, Clayton Brooks, they were influenced by the works of T.S. Eliot. The entire imagery criticism of G. Wilson Knight, Caroline Spurgeon, even Elsie Knights find in T.S. Eliot a seminal influence. So his critical practice became a model. What T.S. Eliot said about criticism, according to T.S. Eliot, criticism is or should remain as disinterested exercise of intelligence. Criticism should remain the disinterested exercise of intelligence. It should be the elucidation of works of art and the correction of taste and definitely the common pursuit of true judgment. The word judgment recurs again and again in the modernist or structuralist criticism, formalist criticism of the English formalist school. The new critics followed his injunctions to center argument and they often found in passages and poems. Comparison analysis that Eliot once said are the chief tools of critics. So it is the comparative study between two texts, evaluation of the text and the judgment based on this evaluative comparative risk study of the text. So interpretation of the text is based on this chief tool of precise perception of literary effects the relationships and values of that literary effect through comparison and analysis. So Eliot was lamenting definitely of the rise of copiously detailed interpretation of text. So large volumes of works were written on leading writers of the age of the Elizabethan period 
and of course of the Victorian period. So he called these critics as lemon squeezers. I do not know why, but one thing is that that honest criticism is not that, according to T. S. Eliot. So you cannot write a novel on a novel saying that you are a critic. That is what T. S. Eliot is. You cannot write a poem on a poem. So criticism is not writing poetry, rather it is very objective, honest criticism according to T. S. Eliot and sensitive appreciation should be directed not upon the poet but upon poetry. Interesting, this is a departure from the bilateral criticism. So when we read Coleridge's Kubla Khan, major emphasis is placed on Kubla's paradise as a projection of Coleridge's opium dream. So this was refuted by T.S. Eliot. So artist, artist is objective, artist is a poet, poet is an artist and a creator whose work is to be interpreted. So honest criticism and sensitive appreciation should be directed not upon the poet but upon poetry. This is a refutation of the bilateral criticism, even of the psychological criticism that emphasis emphasized on the psychology of the poet and try to analyze the poetic process rather than the poetry itself. His contemporary I. A. Richards was working on practical criticism. So T. S. Eliot is trying to balance I. A. Richards practical criticism with his own concept of tradition and through a comparative study of the classical works with the modern works, he is trying to derive a structuralist interpretation or a formalist interpretation of artwork. T. S. Eliot says that in the second section of tradition and individual talent that tradition should always evaluate it in terms of the past and each poet works on the past although innovates. So individual talent is not very praiseworthy according to T.S. Eliot. If the writer is steeped in the tradition of the past, in the mind of the Europe, then only a new kind of work can come out from the poet that he can call. So it is kind of experimentation with form and content. Several critics in the 1970s and after T.S. Eliot, especially the new critical formalist even psychoanalytic critics like Harold Bloom, they have uh, analyzed T.S. Eliot's criticism and sought to revitalize the romantic tradition that Eliot has shunned. So we can find that in Eliot's argument against the romantic creed of poetry, there is much to say, but T.S. Eliot and the new critics' tradition has provided a scope for a new objective, honest criticism. And definitely they maintain that a narrow and elitist enshrining a limited range of author and prescribing to students a partial misleading literary history. So T.S. Eliot was influential in the making of say the great tradition, F.R. Lewis's work, the great tradition. So the critics of T.S. Eliot talk about this, the selective reading of the work and then placing them at the center of the literary culture and giving the name great is T.S. Eliot's fault according to them. But the mind of the poet, T.S. Eliot says, is like a shade of platinum. A shade of platinum that will not get affected by the chemical reaction. So the mind of the poet is like the shade of platinum and without undergoing change from within, the poet will be producing a work of art. But what about the critic? If the critic is selecting his own material, his own subject, his own critical text, as well as critical tools to evaluate the works that are time tested and then placing the text in the modernist repertoire and calling them great. So this is T.S. Eliot's dangerous journey into the world of tradition. So he hears tradition and only those works that are traditional in that sense, not the experimental work. Ironically, the most experimental work of modernist art literature comes with J. Alfred Prufo, the love song of J. Alfred Prufo. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread against the sky, like the evening. So, like a patient etherized on a dressing table. Such a combination, innovative combination of images and a total break away from the traditional work of art. 
reviving the tradition of John Donne, Robert Browning. So this objectivity of the writer who can dramatize situation present. So T.S. Eliot is never confused with J. Alfred Pufford. T.S. Eliot, how many T.S. Eliot's do we find? So to how many Shakespeare's do we find in Shakespearean plays? We cannot say that Shakespeare is Hamlet just because Shakespeare is not Macbeth. So this is a self-contradiction that we find in T.S. Eliot. If Shakespeare is Hamlet, then Shakespeare cannot be Macbeth, Shakespeare cannot be. So this is the shortcoming of T.S. Eliot. T.S. Eliot himself confessed that calling such a great work of art an artistic failure was a fault and that he rectified in his later works. So while such critics have exposed T.S. Eliot's failings, they have nevertheless not never lessened T.S. Eliot's reputation as a critic, as one of the best, finest critic of the 20th century. Now we are reading most of his works with a new insight, but we should also keep in mind the critical temperament of the age and T.S. Eliot's path-breaking new theoretical perspective as against the great tendency of art to merge with society. This social perspective is definitely absent in T.S. Eliot and therefore several critics, especially the socially oriented critics have condemned T.S. Eliot and have even called that as a dystopia by an Anglo-Catholic classicist traditionalist poet. So to read T.S. Eliot is to discover new areas and critical arguments. Literary modernism without T.S. Eliot is not possible. So he is the founder of the modernist art, especially with reference to literary criticism, with reference to poetry, and even with reference to the revival of poetic drama that is works state. With this short introduction to T.S. Eliot, we will then take up individual essays and analyze these essays. I hope I can make a short introduction to T.S. Eliot clear to you all. Thank you very much.